All right, so let's have our last session uh, today. Uh, we're going to have now Barry Lower, and it's a great pleasure to, to have him here. Uh, he's a professor at Rutgers University at New Brunswick. Uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, really, really, uh, we're really glad to have you here. <laughs> when, when I say that, I don't mean what you are thinking of. <laughs> All right. And Gabriel Bogravi again, our uh, commentator uh, from the University, Federal University of Mato Grosso. So let's have him. Okay, thanks, Rodrigo. Oops, I need to use this. So thanks, Rodrigo and uh, I'm Marco and Rodrigo and Gustav for organizing this. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I've wanted to visit Brazil since I was, I think, eight years old and read a great book called Amazon Adventure. Um, I won't get to go to the Amazon, but uh, uh, Tiradentes is beautiful and less dangerous. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tiradentes, incidentally, it strikes me as a really appropriate name for a place for, to, for a philosophy professor to give a, a, a lecture because I don't know about you other philosophers here, but for me, uh, teaching philosophy is often like pulling teeth. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm really grateful to be here and, and also because I was invited here five, five years ago by Wilson and I had a sort of medical emergency then and couldn't come. Um, so I'm really happy that I survived and able to, to come this year. Uh, so my talk is going to be a bit different from the talks before. I'm not focusing, although it's related to some work that Dave has done and to a, a big project that he's laid out. It's not about a specific work that he's done, but rather about something that I've been interested in, which I could connect to his project, and so I thought it met the conditions for the, giving a talk here. Um, so what I've been interested in working on the last years is uh, accounts of what a law of nature is and what probability is and what counterfactuals and causation are, sort of the physical modalities. And there's a particular view that I like about these, um, the physical modalities that derives from David Lewis's views. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. And I've also been working on some issues in philosophy of physics particularly in the foundations of statistical mechanics. And I have a view about that. Um, it's, um, it's not original with me, though I've developed it a bit. Um, it dates back to Boltzmann and more recently developed by David Albert, who's my friend and uh, I work, write with sometimes. Um, and that's what the mentaculus refers to in this paper. So I'm using these as an excuse for giving a talk, or rather I'm giving a talk about free will and an argument about free will as an excuse for telling you about the mentaculus. Okay, so really what I hope people learn about here is this thing called the mentaculus. And I'll tell you about it because I think it has a, a, a key to unlocking a bunch of issues in the general project of how the manifest image sits on top of the scientific image of the world. Okay. Um, and this is the project that Dave has also contributed a lot to. He has a very vivid conception of it in his um, Locke lectures uh, in the book Constructing the World, in which the idea was to find a, uh, a small set of uh, sentences or propositions about the world from which everything else about the world can be a priori derived. And the idea is, or the way I'm understanding this idea, is that it's physics who's in the business of at least providing the, the major part of the propositions about the world, the fundamental physical account of the world from which everything else can be, um, is in some sense related maybe by a priori derivation, maybe by something uh, uh, else. Um, but people now call it grounding or supervenience or something along those lines. Um, 
So there's a, a similar project is was, was David Lewis's project, which I'll call Jungian physicalism. Um, Lewis didn't call it that, but uh, it seems like a good name to me. And it says that the compact class from which everything else will be derived is even more sparse than Dave's, um, uh, David Chalmers' class because Lewis thinks that he can um, uh, derive or at least uh, uh, that the class of physical truths will entail the psychological truths and consciousness truths, but also that it will entail all the modal truths about the world, um, the physical modalities. Right? So what laws are and what um, causation is and what chances are, um, are determined by the distribution of fundamental physical quantities throughout all of space-time in the world. And um, while I won't have a chance, except in the, con in the discussion maybe later, to really go into details about how it connects up with the mentaculus, I'll mention that a little bit as we um, go along. Okay, so one of the me features of our world and uh, is that human beings have what we think of as free will. We can um, make, deliberate, make choices, and then act. And there's, of course, been a long tradition of worry about there being a conflict between um, human beings having free will and there being a fundamental physical, uh, complete physical characterization of the world. Uh, Kant, for example, was worried by this. And I don't think I'll read this big, oops. He messed up here. This uh, uh, long quote from Kant, but it makes the, the point um, of there being a worry about there being an incompatibility between human beings acting freely and um, uh, there being a, a, a fundamental physical theory of the world. Um, the, the conflict is usually brought up if the fundamental laws are complete and deterministic, but there's a similar worry about it, um, even if the fundamental laws were indeterministic, as long as they com uh, completely cover all of the events in the world. Um, so there's an argument, famous argument in the, in the metaphysics literature. Uh, I don't know where it goes back to. But I know it was formulated by Richard Taylor at one point, and then Peter Van Inwagen uh, um, has written, I don't know, God knows how many papers in which he formulates this particular argument, uh, in which is, he thinks is supposed to show that uh, free will and determinism are incompatible with each other. And uh, we'll go through the argument in just a second, but just so you, I orient you to what my talk is about, in, um, in this account of statistical mechanics that I'll explain to you in a while, um, I noticed that it has the resources to provide a kind of um, rep rebuttal, an interesting rebuttal of Van Inwagen's argument. So that's the structure, funny structure to my paper. Uh, like I said, we're going to talk about Van Inwagen's argument mainly so I can show you what the, the use of the, men the mentaculus and what it can be, uh, one of its uses. Okay, well, in the free will literature, um, there's a, uh, two main views. Uh, compatibilists think that there's a notion of free will that is the one that's really important to us that is compatible with the laws, fundamental laws being deterministic. And the incompatibilists think that that's not the case, that the important notion of free will is incompatible with the fundamental laws being deterministic. Um, and Van Inwagen, as I was mentioning, formulated an argument that's called the consequence argument that claims to show, I see I've done with Sophie. It's, it's hard to do two things at once to deal with it. <laughs> okay, but I'll remember now. Um, good. Um, I, I, I can, I, you know, I, I can prove to you, I can, I can rub my, my head and thumb my nose at the same time. 
Um, good. So, okay, so we're going to talk about the consequence argument. So it's important to see that what I'm going to do as far as the, the philosophical content of um, uh, this talk, it's the, a rebuttal of the consequence argument. But along the way, I'm going to exhibit a bunch of other stuff and talk about a bunch of other issues. Um, so it's important for me that you understand how I'm thinking of the consequence argument. It's supposed to be a reductio of the claim that um, free will and the fundamental laws of physics are deterministic, um, are compatible with each other. Okay. And Van Inwagen's argument goes like this. He says that if, in fact, we assume that there is a sense of I can freely choose to do this or that. Um, uh, uh, and he's assuming this just for the purposes of his reductio. Um, and if the laws are deterministic, then he's going to show that, in fact, I have no influence over the future. And of course, it, what use would a notion of free will be if it turns out that I don't have any influence over the future? So that's what his argument is supposed to de uh, demonstrate. So are we in sync? Good. Okay. Okay. So here's what the argument is. Um, first, determinism. Well, what's that? Okay. Well, by determinism, I mean that the fundamental physical state of the world at some time, um, let's call it time zero. Let's call that state p zero, at a time t zero, some time in the distant past, or for that matter, the future and the deterministic dynamical laws, though they together will imply um, every, the state of the world at every other time, including the fundamental physical state that determines the location of, let's say, a person A's hands at this other time. So that's what I mean by determinism. Um, suppose that at some time T, let's say a moment prior to T prime, A can in the the sense that's relevant to free, free choice, that A can choose to make one of the decisions, either decide to lift her left hand or lift her right hand, and that these influence the location of her hand at the later time, T prime. Uh, and suppose that A actually chooses to lift her left hand. Um, then if the location of her hands at T prime were um, uh, that her right hand was up, either she would have broken the laws of the state of the world at the earlier time would not have been P0, because if what she actually chose was that her left hand would be up, then that would have been implied by the earlier state of the world and the fundamental laws. Um, so if A had chosen um, to lift her left hand instead of lifting her left hand, she would have had to have broken the laws or the state of the world would not have been uh, P0 at the earlier time, or both these things. So that's Van Inwagen's argument. And since he thinks, well, I'll go on a little bit further, that um, this person, imagine person A, can't break the laws. Um, and so it follows from that that the other, only thing would be, there would be this other alternative that A would have uh, done something such that the past would have been different which I'm glossing here as she would have influenced the past. Um, but that can't be because we can't influence the distant past. Um, in fact, somebody might say, look, if you could influence the distant past, then maybe you could decide today to have invested in IBM in 1965. And that would be a good thing to do. Or <clears throat> that was uh, Van Inwagen's example, I guess, Apple. You don't know what IBM is probably, but anyway, invested in Apple. So if determinism is true, A cannot influence the position of her hands in the future. So that's the reductio, that's Van Inwagen's argument. So Van Inwagen thinks that he's demonstrated that uh, there being a relevant sense of can in which I can freely choose to lift my left hand or lift my right hand uh, uh, is incompatible with the fundamental laws being deterministic. Okay, so David Lewis gave a famous reply to Van Inwagen. Van Inwagen says of this reply that it's the best reply to his argument. Um, at least he said this prior to my having sent him my paper about this. I don't know what he thinks now. Um, 
So Lewis wrote a paper called uh, Are We Free to Break the Laws? It was a question in Lewis's title, actually. Um, um, and what Lewis did was to use his account of counterfactuals um, to argue that, look, on his account of counterfactuals, it's, um, while it's right that nobody can do anything such that the doing of that would break a law, it also turns out that when you evaluate a counterfactual about a person's action, decisions in action, it may turn out on Lewis, it does turn out on Lewis's account that if we were to decide or to do something different from what act, one actually did, then a law would have been broken. So this is a pretty subtle distinction that Lewis is making here. The difference between doing something such that if you were to do it, you would be breaking a law, and doing something such that if you were to, had done it, or to do it, a law would have been broken. And he thinks that this is a way of replying to uh, Van Inwagen's argument. Okay, so <clears throat> little sidebar now about um, Lewis's account of counterfactuals. I, it's probably the case that most people in the audience know about Lewis's account of counterfactuals, since it's one of the more important developments in the in 20th century um, metaphysics and semantics. But let me just go over it a bit. So Lewis has an account of counterfactuals in which he says that, look, if A were the case, then B would be the case is true, um, just in case in all the possible worlds that are most similar to the actual world where we're evaluating the counterfactual, that's what we're talking about being true or false, at which A is true, B is also true. That's his semantical truth conditions, the semantics for counterfactuals. Um, although Lewis takes possible worlds very seriously as elements of reality, in fact, that's not needed to, for this uh, uh, to be a good semantical account. Um, so I'm not going to enter that discussion of Lewis's uh, uh, idea that many people um, reject, the idea that a possible world, that there are there actually exists um, this um, plenitude of possible worlds. Um, as, <clears throat> sorry, that the plenitude of possible worlds are um, worlds just like the actual world. There have to be, in order for this semantics to work, there has to be some notion of possible world, but then no, the possible worlds can be abstract um, entities, and the truth conditions would also go through. So a question arises immediately for his account of counterfactuals. Um, what is the notion of world similarity that he's using? Uh, Kit Fine, in a comment, I think a review he wrote of Lewis's book on this, uh, now, gee, I guess about almost 40 something years ago, uh, used as the example, um, <clears throat> if, if Nixon had pushed the button, there would have been a nuclear war. Thinking about this example now, and thinking about what's going on in the United States now, it's really interesting how <laughs> events repeat themselves. Um, I'm not sure interesting is the right word, it's scary. Anyway, uh, find a set of, of Lewis's semantics for counterfactuals. Look, you better tell us what similarity means, because if it means what we normally mean by similarity, you're gonna get the wrong truth value for an ordinary counterfactual like if Nixon had pressed the button, there would have been a nuclear war. Because a world in which uh, Nixon pressed the button, he, he, we all know he didn't press the button, right? Um, good thing. Uh, a world in which he did press the button, but in which there was some failure in the, in the system that would have set off a nuclear war, um, is much more similar to the actual world than a world in which there was a nuclear war. Um, and so, uh, Fine said that your, your kind of, kind of, you, Lewis's account of counterfactuals is going to uh, make the uh, counterfactual, if Nixon had pressed the button, it would have been a nuclear war, turn out to be false. Um, but we think it would have been true, as long as we're assuming, as is reasonable to assume, that the, all of the, uh, um, the, 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 new, the missiles were armed and um, uh, uh, Nixon was... Everybody knows who Nixon was, right? Okay, good. <laughs> I, I, sometimes when I teach, the, teach classes now, I have to explain who 
Nixon was, but he's, he's back in the news now again, I guess. Um, any rate, so Lewis came up with a particular account of world similarity in a paper called uh, Counterfactuals and Time's Arrow. And what he wanted to do is to say, at least in a rough way, when, um, a, 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 when how to evaluate whether worlds different from the actual world are more or less similar to the actual world. And these were the um, conditions that he wrote down. And his basic idea was this, that violations, big violations of laws of the actual world um, make a world very dissimilar from the actual world. Um, whereas uh, uh, differences in uh, fundamental fact, um, if they're not too widespread, um, make the world not too different from the actual world. Small violations of law make a world not too different from the actual world. So he didn't actually produce a, um, uh, a, an exact uh, a characterization of similarity from this, but he thought it was good enough to get counterfactuals coming out more or less right. And, um, uh, and there's an important um, feature of Lewis's account here. And the important feature is that uh, on this account, whether a counterfactual is true or false in the actual world only depends really on facts about the actual world. It doesn't really depend on what's going on in other worlds. The other worlds are being introduced in order to, uh, to refer to facts about the actual world. So Lewis is, is saying that look for the counterfactual. If Nixon had pushed the, the button, there would have been a, a nuclear war. That's true because the actual world is such that the most similar worlds to it, in which the Nixon pushes the button, are worlds in which there's a nuclear war. That actually doesn't really need there to be, mm, the truth makers of that claim are just truths about the actual world. Okay, so here's a little picture. I hope it's seeable, so you can understand how uh, uh, Lewis was imagining evaluating counterfactuals. Um, so the in the upper left-hand corner there, facing it, it's in the left-hand corner. Um, Lewis said, "Look, here's a world in which there's a small violation of the laws of the actual world in this other world. The other world, the alternative world, is just like the actual world." up until a little time before uh, Nixon decides to push the button and pushes the button. And in that world, there's a small violation of laws of the actual world. Of course, there's no violation of the laws of the actual world in the actual world. Lewis assumes that the laws of the actual world are never violated. That's part of what it is to be a law. But in this alternative world, the alternative world is just like the actual world up until it a, a little bit before that Nixon pushes, Nixon decides to push the button. At that time, there's a, a violation of laws in the actual world, but not in this other alternative world. Um, there's no violation of any law that holds there. And then um, because of that little violation, it might, for example, just involve a few neurons firing in Nixon's brain um, that don't fire in the actual world. Um, and uh, that leads has, that ramifies to lead Nixon to um, push, to decide to push the button and to push the button and to be a, nu a nuclear war. So a small violation in the laws of the um, uh, actual world can lead to a gigantic difference in the way the world, this alternative world evolves, Lewis thought. Um, the other worlds that Lewis considered as candidates um, might be a world in which the, the one in the right hand corner in the right hand corner that's a world which is different from the actual world from the earliest times in the actual world from the big bang and since the laws were assuming a deterministic it would be different throughout the whole history of the world lewis considers that world by his account of world similarity um, very different from the actual more more different from the actual world than the world that branched off that we just talked about because it's different in particular fact throughout the whole history of the world. And another possibility that Lewis thinks about in the lower 
left-hand corner, is a world in which there's a small violation of the laws of the actual world, as there is in the, um, uh, the world that Lewis thinks is closest, in which Nixon pushes the button. Um, but that after Nixon pushes the button, there then is a, another big violation of law that gets the, uh, uh, the alternative world to match the actual world from some later time on. And, and Lewis thinks his account of world similarity makes that world less similar than the actual world and the branching off world in the um, up, upper left-hand corner. So that's how Lewis thinks his account of world similarity gets the right result. Um, if you hadn't seen this before, I'm not sure I really said enough so that you can follow it at this point, but I hope I re at least reminded those people who knew about it. Okay, so here was Lewis's response to Van Wagen's argument. I'm telling you about Lewis's response because the response that I'm gonna give is somewhat similar in general structure to the response that Lewis uh, gave, although it's different in particular detail. And the account of counterfactuals I'm gonna tell you about and that I think is, much, uh, is, is different from Lewis's account. I think it's a big improvement over Lewis's account. Okay, so Lewis claims that Nixon can press the button, and if Nixon had, that he, that he can press the button, so he, he thinks there's a compatible sense of can, in which he can press the button, and if Nixon had pressed the button, the laws would have been broken. They would have been broken at the earlier time, but you can see that nothing that Nixon does actually is itself a break, breaking of the law. It's that what Nixon, um, if he had decided to press the button, a law would have been broken. Okay, so that's the subtle distinction that Lewis makes. So that's his reply to Van and Watkins' argument. Anybody convinced by that? No, I'm not convinced by it. Okay, so Lewis rejects uh, the, the consequence argument and in the way I just said, that um, he says that I, A cannot break the laws, it's ambiguous between A cannot perform a law-breaking action and A cannot perform an action such that if she had done it, a law would have been broken. And he says that, look, uh, on his account, it's right that A cannot perform a law-breaking action, but A can do something such that if she had done it, a law would have been broken. And he thinks this avoids the Van and Wagen argument. Okay, so I like Lewis's strategy, but I think his reply fails, and it fails for a really interesting way. Um, uh, it fails because his account of counterfactuals is really, just, just doesn't work. I don't know how widely known this is now. Um, for those people who work on counterfactuals, it's known. But Lewis's account of counterfactuals was so important that many people are taught about it, and I don't know how many people know that it's, um, it's known that it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a really interesting reason. Okay, Lewis in his paper, and it's a great paper, I recommend it to everybody to read. I think it's one of the great philosophy papers of the 20th century. Called, it's called uh, Counterfactuals and Time's Arrow. It's the paper in which he develops his account of world similarity. In that paper, he also says that, look, the way he's evaluating counterfactuals um, has the following consequence. He thinks that it means that if you think of some, there being small differences in the way the actual world might go at a time, that could make for big differences at subsequent times, what we think of as the future, but not at earlier times, just like in that, uh, well, there's not a backspace on your computer. <laughs> <laughs> the, one of the, in the, 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 uh, the picture I had in the lower left-hand corner. So there, the, the alternative world matched the act. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I couldn't change it anyway. Well, you could do it. <laughs> I feel like I'm your avatar or something. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so, so Lewis thinks that his account has this general consequence that it'll make counterfactuals generally such that had there been small differences at a certain time, it would, could make for big, it would 
typically make for big differences at subsequent times, but not for big differences at earlier times. And he thought that this might be a key to understanding the arrow of time. Okay, so this is one of the big issues in the philosophy of physics or in metaphysics, is how to understand why it is that time seems to have a direction. Okay, now it's not really that time has a direction, I think, although that's the way we often talk about it. It's rather that the processes within time uh, are directional. So, for example, um, are what we can influence. We can influence things in one temporal direction, but not in the other temporal direction. Um, and we have, can have much more information about events that took place in one temporal direction, that's the past in this case, than in the other temporal direction. Um, and many, many processes in our world exhibit a temporal directionality. Put an ice cube in warm water and it'll melt. Um, put a little perfume, spray some perfume in the corner of the room, and after a while it'll fill the whole room. Um, processes like that are fall under a, um, a, a law in thermodynamics called the second law of thermodynamics, which say, says that a quantity called entropy, which we don't really need to get into its detail, but it basically has to do with, um, in thermodynamics, with a, a function of heat and temperature. And it, um, uh, the second law says that this quantity always increases. Uh, over time, and one of the puzzles that confronted physicists when they were first thinking about this law back in the 19th century was how there could be a, a law uh, with in, of law in physics which exhibits a temporal directionality when the fundamental dynamical laws of physics don't exhibit any temporal directionality. What I mean by that, and I'm sure many people have heard this already, and you know about it, is that any sequence of positions of particles or fields that um, are compatible with the law, for any such sequence, the reverse, the temporally reverse sequence are also compatible with the laws. So Lewis thought that maybe he had found something like a key to what might ground at least some of the time's arrows, some of the temporal asymmetries um, in his account of counterfactuals. Unfortunately, he didn't, though. And in fact, the temporal symmetry of the, of the fundamental laws undermines his the theory of counterfactuals. And this is a point that was made um, by, in a paper by Adam Elga, maybe now about 12 or 13 years ago, um, and also uh, made by me and by David Albert in a couple of things that we had written um, around the same time. Um, but Adam's paper, though, is re really nice. It makes the point very, very clearly. Uh, so the problem is this, that if we could, went back to the worlds that we were looked at before, um, Lewis neglected thinking about a world that starts off very differently from the actual world. It's kind of like the world in the upper left-hand corner but turned upside down. A world which starts out very differently from the actual world, but the particle positions and momentum in that world are so arranged so that by a small violation of law, it ends up being able to match the actual world from every time into what we were thinking of there as the future. And because of this, because of the existence of worlds like that that Lewis didn't even think about, it turns out that his truth conditions about counterfactuals are going to have very, uh, not, the, not at all the consequences that he wants. He's going to make true counterfactuals like if Nixon had pushed the button, there wouldn't have been a nuclear holocaust, or at least there might not have been a nuclear holocaust, because there'll be a world that starts out very differently from the actual world, in which Nixon, or something that looks a lot like Nixon at any rate, pushes the button, and um, uh, through a funny, what looks like to us, conspiracy of the positions and momentum of particles, ends up matching the actual world. Okay. So that was the point that Adam Elga made in his paper. And, uh, and here's what an Elga world looks like. I have a picture of it. Good. OK. OK. So, okay, so we went through a long, complicated, circuitous route um, with uh, Van Inwagen's argument for me to make the point that Lewis's strategy for replying 
to Van den Wagen's argument was to reject one of the premises. He rejected the premise that um, uh, um, that that, you, that um, if you had done something, you that that you cannot do something such that if you had done it, a law would not have been broken. Um, it, and what um, uh, and I'm going to do something like what Lewis did, but not. I'm not. Gonna re I'm going to reject a different premise. Um, I'm going to reject the premise about the past. Okay, and I want to explain now how I can do that. Okay, so just to repeat what I just said and I'll make it really clear to everybody. So the argument, to, uh, in Van Imwagen's argument to step six is valid and sound. However, on a proper understanding of influence um, in terms of counterfactual dependence, so I'm going to use the same understanding of influence that we were using in Lewis's account, um, <clears throat> uh, it turns out that we can influence the past. Now, before you go run out to go influence the past and buy Apple stock oh, 10 years ago, I'll hasten to tell you, you won't be able to influence the past like that. Okay, so I'm going to convince, try to can persuade you of something that may strike you as very odd, that we all can influence the past, and we do it all the time, in a sense. Okay, so first, there's some bad reasons to think that you can't influence the past. Somebody might argue, look, um, I, you can't change the past, can you? Who, who can change the past? I mean, if you could change the past, you might change the outcome of the last American election. If somebody might do that. But we, we can't change the past. Well, of course you can't change the past. It's the past. But you can't change the future either, right? And the future is what it is. You can't change it. It's just whatever it is. Same with the past. So what really is important is not change, but rather influence. And what does it mean to influence the future? It means that you can do something now such that if you had, were to do it, the past, the future would be such and such. And you can do something else maybe, such that if you were to do that, the future would be such and such. So talking about influence involves counterfactuals. Same about the past. To influence the past means that you can do something such that if you were to do it, the past would be different in such and such a way. Okay. Um, if there is a compatibilist sense of can, then of course if you can do something different from what you actually did and the laws are deterministic, then um, you can influence the past because the past would have to be different all the way back to the Big Bang if the laws were deterministic. So, um, uh, uh, and this is what le le leads Van Inwagen to say that you, there is no relevant sense of can in which you can do something different from what you actually do. But I'm going to tell you that you can influence the past. Okay, so that's the premise I'm going to reject. Um, but we never notice it. We never notice that we can influence the past. Okay, and um, I don't really want to talk about this. We don't, okay. And the, re the way I'm going to tell you about this now is to tell you about this thing I called the Mentaculus before. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it and uh, then how it underlies an account of counterfactuals, which will have the consequence that you can influence the past, okay? but not in a way that will en enrich you in any way. Okay, so here's what the Mentaculus is. I should first explain to you where this ridiculous name comes from. I know there are a few people in the audience who know this, but maybe most of you don't know. So some of you, most of you, they'll probably know about the Cohn brothers, right? Ethan and Jonathan Cohn. You've seen some of their movies like The Big Lebowski. So they have a movie called The, the Serious Man. Anyone see that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great movie, I think. Um, it's, it's about a, a physicist in his midlife crisis and could easily be about a philosopher in his midlife crisis too. Anyway, in that movie, there's a, uh, a character who has a, um, is, uh, is, he's the brother of the main character, the guy with the midlife crisis. So the, the brother is a guy who never gets out of his pajamas, spends all his time scribbling in a little book. And um, uh, somebody asks him, What's, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm writing the mentaculus. <laughs> 
And then he says, what's that? And he says, it's a probability map of the universe. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you about is a probability map of the universe. Before telling you what the details are about it, I'll mention that I was giving a talk about this in Germany a few years ago, and I forgot to tell this, the story about where I got the name Mentaculus from. And in the question period, somebody raised his hand and wanted to know that whether I knew that the Cone brothers had stolen this name from me. <laughs> I had to disabuse him of that. Um, I, 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 I don't really know Ethan Cohn, but I got into an email correspondence with him, and which I told I asked him if it was okay if we used this name for uh, this uh, theory, and uh, he said sure. He thinks that's a great idea, and it turns out that he's also he he has a big interest in philosophy. He was a philosophy major at Princeton, and uh, he's scribbling, writing a book in logic that, in order to make fun of him, his family calls it the Mentaculus. So, I. I I hope you understand why we, the we is me and David Albert who have been writing about this, why we named this a mentaculus. So here's what it consists in. It consists of the fundamental dynamical laws that hold in our universe. These are the fundamental microscopic laws. If, if the world were Newtonian, the, wor they, the fundamental dynamical laws would be some version of F equals MA. Hamilton's equations of the principle of least action or something like that. Um, the Lagrange equation, something like that. Um, if the law, if the, since our world is quantum mechanical, it's some appropriate version of the quantum mechanical dynamical laws. Um, so that's just taken for granted. That comes from physicists. Okay, then it needs, to, we need to add to that a specification of the macroscopic state of the universe at the time around the Big Bang that says that the universe was in a state of very, very low entropy at this early time and then a uniform probability distribution over all the possible micro-histories of the world that could satisfy the deterministic dynamical laws at the earlier time. I should tell you, um, it's sometimes said that quantum mechanics is a prob indeterministic theory. Um, the fundamental uh, dynamical law of quantum mechanics is deterministic, it's Schrodinger's equation. Probabilities enter the theory, they have to enter the theory in some way or other, but they, it'd be that the theory is completely deterministic, even though there are probabilities in it. And um, we might come back to talking about that in the question period, but I want to get to the end of my talk before we get to the question period. Okay, so here are the three ingredients of the mentaculus. The fundamental dynamical laws, a specification of the macro state of the universe, which says that the early state of the universe had very, very low entropy. This is the state of the universe right after the Big Bang, and a uniform probability distribution over all the possible micro-histories that could, the, could realize the, this very low entropy state. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, it turns out that Lewis's Humeanism about laws and probabilities fits in with the mentaculus really, really well, but I'm not gonna talk about that now. Okay. Now, why should anybody believe this mentaculus? It's really a theory in physics. It's not a philosopher's theory. It turns out it has enormous philosophical uses. So I'm not the first person to think about this at all. And uh, Boltzmann, who is the inventor of, of statistical mechanics, basically presents something like this. Uh, he didn't he very... He, he had different ideas about how to think about the fundamental laws of thermodynamics, uh, to think about the relationship between thermodynamics and the fundamental microscopic laws. Um, but one of his ideas is very close to this idea. And later it's suggested by Richard Feynman in a, a very nice book, uh, lectures that he wrote called The Character of Physical Law. But when Feynman suggests it, he writes about it as though it was an idea that was around um, and he was just formulating it there. And the, the best discussion of it I know about is in a book by, um, uh, by David Albert called Time and Chance that was published now about 18 years ago or so. And uh, there's another nice book by a physicist called Sean Carroll in which he presents this sort of picture of the uh, the fundamental laws of the universe. So the fundamental laws are the dynamical laws together with these two additional assumptions and they have law-like status. 
One of them is the claim that the universe is in very low entropy, and the other is that it's, uh, there's a probability distribution over the micro histories that could realize or be, are consistent with this very low entropy state at the uh, time of the Big Bang. Now, it turns out that this theory doesn't make a past future distinction in the following sense. While I've been talking about the time, the ent low entropy holding at the time of the Big Bang, really, the way, um, if we had time to develop this, I would argue that this time is the past from our time now because all of time's arrows originate from this earlier, what, we, what I'm calling earlier time, from this boundary condition, the um, time of the, of the low entropy state. Why should anybody believe this? Well, the reason one should believe it is that it, this entails the second law of thermodynamics and, I would argue, entails all the other temporal arrows that we're familiar with. Now, showing that would be a tremendous amount of work and we'd be here in you know, weeks, not just until midnight, but at least another week if I were to go through all of the argumentation for that. But you can get a feeling for how this might work in the following way. Um, in, given the, let's say, an ice cube put in warm water, the entropy of that situation is not high, small. Um, and uh, it turns out that almost every, um, uh, that the, the entropy of, the, of, the, um, of that system when the ice cube is melted is high. And that's why the melting of an ice cube falls under the second law of thermodynamics. Um, the um, a probability distribution works in the following way. Of all of the microscopic states which realize or are consistent with an ice cube being in warm water, most of them are such that they there will evolve to higher entropy states. And the reason for that is that um, almost all states are states of high entropy. So if you were to think about all of the positions and momenta of particles, almost all of them, you just stick your hand into a collection of possible states, you're almost sure to pick out one of a high entropy because almost all states are ones with states that are said to be at equilibrium high entropy. And you can sort of see why that's the case because in the um, uh, ice cube that's in warm water, that's a rather special situation. There'll have to be some molecules whose momenta are very restricted so that they um, keep the ice cube together where other molecules are in the water. They're momenta are such that they can be moving around in various ways. Over time, as the molecules that are moving faster bang into the molecules in the ice cube, they'll transfer energy to it and the momentum will tend to equilibrate. After a while, they actually reach a certain distribution of what the, uh, um, of, of the momenta, of the velocities of the molecules, which is the equilibrium distribution um, after a while. And there are many, many more states which um, uh, exhibit that distribution. So that's a sort of rough and extremely rough imagistic way of explaining how, why the second law works the way it does. Um, so the claim is that there's reason to believe them in Taculus because it entails a probabilistic version of the second law. The second law turns out to be just probabilistically correct. It's, that it's very likely that the ice cube will melt when it's in, in put into warm water. There's a teeny, teeny probability that it won't melt, a teeny, teeny probability that the ice cube will actually grow bigger, a teeny pro probability that it'll actually turn into a, what looks like a banana in a while. But these are very, very rare situations, so rare that if one were to say, uh, let's say the, the, there would be something like 10 to the 10 to the 23rd um, uh, 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 trajectories that the molecules might be on in which the ice cube ends up being melted in 15 minutes to every one in which the ice cube is bigger at the, at, uh, in, in a few minutes. Okay, so the, I'm telling you the metaculus is true. Here's what the world would look like 
if the mentaculous was true about the world. You know, the world would start, of all the possible, so the bottom line is all the possible states of the particles or fields, that the particles or fields the worlds could be in. And the little circle at the bottom is the low entropy state. There are very, very few, relatively few. The picture's way out of whack as far as the uh, scale is concerned because the low entropy is absolutely tiny, um, the low entropy state. If I were to put this to scale, you couldn't even see that circle there, and the, the, all the possible states would extend all the way to Rio. Okay. Um, so there's a very small, very, our universe began in a very, very special state, very special low entropy state. Um, still, there were still infinitely many possible momenta and positions of the particles in this very low entropy, compatible with this very low entropy state. Um, the, the macroscopic state of the universe then evolved in such a way that it evolves deterministically, let's say along the middle line, along with the deterministic microscopic evolution of the microscopic state. Um, uh, but the macroscopic state, if we just look at if we coarse grain things and just look at the macroscopic evolution of the world, the world would look like it was evolving indeterministically. Um, so, for example, think about the ice cube in water. It may be that its evolution is really deterministic. Let's suppose it is. But if we just look at the ice cube in the water, it will appear to us to be indeterministic. We'll notice that, you know, the little one part of the ice cube will, will melt a little bit more quickly than another. But from a macroscopic characterization of the ice cube in the water, we won't be able to tell where that um, will happen in the ice cube. So it'll look chancy to us. So the idea here in this picture is that the macroscopic evolution of the world is indeterministic, while the microscopic evolution is, de is deterministic. Um, sometimes this is put, you know, in a, in a way that everybody has heard that a butterfly, whether a butterfly flaps its wings or not in, I don't know, in, in Rio may make for a storm in New York later on. I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, you know, small differences in microscopic states can make for very big differences in macroscopic states down the world, down the way. And that, in fact, can happen. And that's just the kind of structure that Lewis was hoping to get. So now you can see the connection that I'm going to make. So, um, <clears throat> so I want to say now that Lewis's account of counterfactuals, it was completely blown up by the, uh, the Albert Elga uh, objection. Uh, but we can come up with a better account now in terms of the fundamental probabilities from the mentaculus. Uh, another point I should have made earlier, that when I call the mentaculus, or when the guy in the, in the movie Serious uh, um, Man called the, his mentaculus a probabilistic map of the world, you can see why I call, we're calling this the mentaculus. Because the probability distribution over all of the uh, microscopic states will yield a probability distribution over everything. Okay, so the mentaculus will entail probabilities over things like how likely it is, given the macroscopic state of the universe now, how likely it is that, I don't know, Trump will be impeached in, three, in four months. Um, unfortunately, I have no idea how to figure out what that probability is, but, um, but that probability exists as the mentaculus is, is a, a correct theory of the world. Okay. Okay, it also turns out that we can give an account of counterfactuals in terms of the mentaculus. If you want to read about this in detail, I published a paper about eight years ago or so called uh, Counterfactuals in the Second Law, which um, spells this out a little bit more. But the basic idea is this, that <clears throat> um, a counterfactual like if um, Nixon had pushed the button, there would have been a nuclear war, turns out to be true, if the conditional probability of there being a war, given that Nixon pushed the button and the rest of the macroscopic state of the world at that time is very, very high. And there's good reason to think that it would be very high. 
So I think that this account is, avoids the kind of objection that Elga had, and it avoids it because in part of what we're doing in this account is excluding worlds like the Elga world, which begins off, begins in this very high entropy state and sort of is the reverse of the actual, the temporal reverse of the actual world. Okay. <clears throat> so claim that this account of um, uh, counterfactuals that I spelled out on the previous uh, uh, slide um, has the kind of temporal asymmetry built into it that Lewis was aiming to get. Okay. But they also have a bit of um, uh, such, they also, these counterfactuals also work in such a way that if you were to consider an alternative um, to the actual world, uh, like Nixon pushed the button, then the past would be different also. But they'd be different only microscopically. If you go back to the um, picture that I had on the board before of the branching structure of the universe, you could see, uh, I know I've been going on a long time, right? very long time, but I'm like, Fine. This is okay. Okay, here it is. I will come to a conclusion in a minute. Um, you can see that um, alternatives micro that are small microscopic alternatives may lead to big differences. Um, but if we were to go back, we'd eventually have to get back all of the the uh, the, the trajectories will get back sucked back into the very low entropy state at the beginning of the universe, um, or what we now call the beginning because it has the slow entropy state then. Um, and um, for this reason, um, while it's the case that if Nixon had pushed the button, the past would have been different all the way back to the beginning, it would have been different just microscopically. So the small difference that would lead to the neurons um, firing, they would lead to f the neurons firing on a different microscopic trajectory from the actual microscopic trajectory. That's the one we have to consider when we're thinking about the, um, the counterfactual if Nixon had pushed the button, um, because he didn't push the button. So if he had pushed the button, the past would have been different all the way back to the Big Bang. But it would have been different in a, just in a microscopic way. And so, of course, this is completely interesting to us. It's nothing that we ever know about or can have any um, knowledge about. We have no idea about how it would have been different. Okay. So now I think you can see how I'm going to make use of the Mentaculus to, um, uh, to reply to Van den Magen's um, uh, argument. So decisions, um, the counterfactuals involving decisions, involve small changes in our brains, I'm assuming. And these small differences in our brains can make for big differences in the, uh, the, the time span away from the past, the low entropy uh, state of the past, but make for there being uh, only microscopic differences in the time span um, in the direction of the past hypothesis. This, I think, is the grounding of all of time's arrows. Um, it's the right way to, in which statistical mechanics grounds the, the, both the, uh, the temporal asymmetry of knowledge and records and the temporal asymmetry of influence um, uh, and the, the second law of thermodynamics. So what, what the, the claim I'd make for this, I'm not demonstrating that here, like I said, this would be a long story, but the claim I'm making here is that the metaculous story about the world, theory of the world, is the explanation about why there are time's arrows, why team time seems to pass to us. Of course, in order to give that account, I'd have to get help from people in psychology um, in order to give an account of how we lay down um, uh, uh, me uh, memories in, in, uh, and wh why that gives, gives rise to the experience of time passing. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll pass that problem over to you guys who do philosophy of consciousness. Uh, but the idea would be that the underlying physics which is required for that is this mentaculous account of physics. Um, so if you stop and you think about now what I mean by time passing here, I'm imagining a block universe conception of time. You know, so in that sense, time isn't doing anything. It's not 
moving or passing or anything. But what happens that in the block universe, uh, events exhibit patterns in, in such a way that those patterns satisfy certain temporal asymmetries. And the granddaddy or the grandmother of all of those asymmetries, the mother of all these asymmetries, is the low entropy of the universe at one of the boundaries. And the probabilistic distribution gives how likely it is that these, um, that the temporal asymmetries will be exhibited in any particular circumstance. And it turns out to be that the probabilities are overwhelmingly large, like in the case of the ice cube melting in, in water. Okay. On the other hand, our decisions, while they do have counterfactual, uh, there are counterfactual uh, dependencies between our decisions and things in the past, they're completely uninteresting and unimportant to us. So our influence over the past is, I would say, paltry and, and, and uh, unimportant. One way to bring this up is, in the case of Van and Wagen's argument, is to make a distinction between influence and control. Uh, do I do that in this paper? Yeah. Um, so let, let's say that A has control over whether or not, um, not A, whether or not P, so whether or not something holds. Um, if A has influence, I don't know what I wrote on this slide, but when the second A is, I mean, mean to say something like, A has control over whether or not her hands are, are raised. So say A has control over whether or not her her hand is raised, uh, just in case she has influence over it, that means there's a count counterfactual dependence between whether her hand is raised or not, that depends on her decision, and also that she knows um, uh, or has good reason to believe that her hand will be raised when she decides that her hand will be raised. So sometimes you decide that your hand will be raised and it's not, because someone comes and you know, holds it down, but that's a very unusual situation. Um, generally, we have control over whether or not our hands are, are, are the position of our hands on the basis of our decisions. Um, so that's what it is to have control. So um, we, while we have control over some events in the future, not many, not as, as much as we like usually, but we have some, we have no control over any events in the past. So one thing one could do is to go back over Van Inwagen's argument and say, look, um, uh, uh, it's, you're, you're trying to show that if determinism is true, we have no control over the future. But in fact, we can have control over the future because in order for you to, for your argument to work, you'd have to sh show that we, um, uh, that it would lead to us having control over the past. And we clearly don't have any control over the past. But I've shown how, by in the, the account in the Mentaculus, shown how it can turn out to be the case that we can have control over the future without having any control over the past. Okay, so, first conclusion for all of this, when we'll come to the conclusion now. Uh, so on the account of counterfactuals I've sketched, there may be correlations between alternative decisions probabilistic correlations that underlie the uh, counterfactuals, um, and future states of affairs that correspond to the contents of those decisions. But although there are correlations between alternative decisions and past microhistories, these correlations never support influence over the past states of affairs that we're in a position to know about or of any interest to us. So my response to Van Inwagen's argument is that while his argument is valid, one of its premises is mistaken. This is the argument when formulated in terms of the notion of influence. The argument is valid, all right, but one of his premises is mistaken because we do have influence over the past. On the other hand, if we were to formulate his argument in terms of control, then the argument would turn out not to be valid. So it's not surprising that we evolve so that our decisions are future directed and they're never past directed and that we've come to believe, mistakenly if I'm correct, that we have no influence over the past. If, and if that's your reason for thinking that determinism or free will are incompatible, then that's going to mistake as well. Um, and finally, we have moved, removed one roadblock to the truth of what I called earlier Jungian metaphysics or to the general project if you don't want to be as sparse as Lewis was, but like Dave, but have 
Dave's a priori uh, scrutability thesis, remove one roadblock to the um, uh, uh, to the um, uh, claim that we have free will. Uh, the roadblock we've removed is Van and Wagen's argument. Important point: I haven't shown, I haven't demonstrated that we have free will. There may be other reasons to think that we don't have free will. What I've done is to show that Van and Wagen's argument um, is not a good argument. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I'm going to reconstruct um, Barry's uh, roads, but I, I'll especially I'll, I'll be especially interested in some major steps of the argument. Um, I think the argument is very ingenious. It's very ingenious, very interesting argument. Um, maybe I start with these important features because I think uh, is the picture clear to everyone, or will I reconstruct the argument? That we may explain it. I don't know. I, I don't see how it could be clear. Given <laughs> <laughs> okay, so given so I do. This, I, I follow the same strategy I did with Pickle. I'll reconstruct the argument in in more detail, and then I'll focus on special steps of the argument. So first, Barry starts uh, with the with Chalmers APS and. I think that's important to, to support the, some view that um, Lewis Hume and physicalism from the standpoint of, for example, a Laplacian intellect would work. Um, so, and it, it takes that the human physicalism is a kind of compact class within the APS. That's important to notice. It's a subset of truths within Chalmers APS. Uh, that's an important step. It seems pretty obvious that this physical truth will be just a subset of the whole APS. Okay. So this, Pre Barry presents his most important desideratum, a possibility of giving an account of influence that reboots the argument for the incompatibility of taking together human physicalism and the influence and the, the, the argument is also compatible of human physicalism, even if it does not depend on human physicalism, it's compatible with the way David Lewis uh, understands human physicalism. Uh, okay. Then Barry says that he assumes, as, as Van den Wagen does, at least for the purpose of the Redux show, that there is a compatibilist sense of having power or can, on each a person can choose among alternative decisions. And he says that, I mean, at least in Wagen says that he, that he takes this sense of can to be primitive to the discussion. I think that's not that primitive. I think it's probably assuming a, a very strong version of definition, a strong version of a definition of choice, which is all good considering there's reduction if you reduct a stronger adversary, uh, it's better to defeat uh, a weaker adversary. So for the sake of the reduction, it's very courageous to insist in a strong version of choice. And that type of choice is what, for example, Dennett would use the expression, it could be otherwise. Because for some um, definitions of free will, people will insist in this very strong version of choice in the sense that it could be otherwise. It could be different. It's not a question, it's not just control uh, in the sense we have in some sciences. It, it's really a course of action different from, from the other. Okay, in my view, and that's a commentary of mine to, uh, to criticize Inwagen, not uh, Barry Lauer, I think the argument for Inwagen suffers from what the great majority of mainstream philosophers working on free will within a incompatibilist account suffer, namely not considering that as we are part of the physical chain, we are part of a causal chain. We are physical, so we're not breaking the laws. We are part of the physical chain. Of course, saying that 
yet does not grant any sufficient cause for saying that such a decisions are conscious, not at all. And, but even though we can say that her decision to, her, to raise her arm is causally relevant to the course of action. Also, we can say that no law is broken here. Nevertheless, it's not enough to vindicate such a strong definition of choice, because the definition of choice is very strong, as the one accepted here. Just, just, just comments where I take some per, of my personal credence to evaluate the whole picture. By the way, I don't buy at all Lou's response to invoking as sufficient. I don't think differentiating the ability to break a law from the ability to do something such that if I did it, a law will be broken. I mean, to me this is just a play of words from a affirmative form to a passive form. Uh, I don't think it's, that brings, I, I, I actually prefer Barry Lowers as treasure than Lewis, to be sincere. Uh, isn't, and I think this is not enough to save human physicalism from determinism. But Lewis understands himself that the nature of model logic grants that no action is broken, as, as Barry has explained pretty, pretty well. Because if you consider the, 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 the possible words, they are similar enough to it. The laws are maintained. The facts are changed. Okay? But, but this, Professor Barry Lower takes a very, start, a very smart strategy, which is allowed from his change in terms of inter interpretative ma matrix from model logic to the fundamental dynamic laws. That is to sub substitute the statement that time is asymmetrical in itself to the vision that processes in time are asymmetrical. And I think that is a very uh, interesting move because time probably has no direction, but proce thermodynamic processes in time have, has a direction, have a direction, sorry. So in order to do that, he's using three core premises First, the fundamental, the fundamental dynamic laws of physics. That we can take for granted. I mean, if, if the work physicists are doing a good job, uh, at least it's not controversial at this moment. I, of course, you could use Hempel's dilemma to create some problems here. But that's the best physics we have in the moment. So I think that is not controversial at all. Um, is widespread, is widespread in past books and readers and the best universities. Uh, it's not um, very controversial, contentious to accept it. And then some two extra premises, a specification of the macro state of the universe at the time of the Big Bang that says that the entropy of the universe was very small, uh, which uh, somehow entails the past hypothesis and a uniform probability distribution of all micro histories of the world that satisfy the dynamic laws and the past hypothesis, uh, thesis or uh, past, past time hypothesis. Better to phrase as a hypothesis than a thesis. Uh, I think, as I said, the two extra premises, uh, are not, I, I don't know if they can, take, can be taken for granted. I don't think they are trivial at all, but I think Professor Barry Law defended them quite well and showed that they, they are at least not incompatible with the first premise and not incompatible with the laws of physics. So we have a plenty of reasons to believe they, at least in terms of a coherency, it's paradigm of epistemology, at least possibly true. And I, I, I forecast one probable, probable objection that could be possible. For example, if superstring theory succeeds to prove his truth, what will happen to the mentaculus? Uh, is the mentaculus keep valid because we have an alteration of uh, the quantum of energy that is presented. At, instead of believing in a Big Bang, you have to uh, believe that the universe is compressed and then expands, compressed and expands. So, I, I, I mean, that was an intuition I have just, yeah. that was uh, like KP notes and whatever, because I, I said that it's an interesting intuition. I don't know the consequences yet. I'll, I would like to see if you could talk about that as well. Uh, 
because it's very important through the thesis, so the, thesis, the whole thesis makes sense that the entropy of the universe was very small at this, this first moment. Okay. Those are, my, I think, my, my most important questions, uh, but I have a doubt as well that I think it's bring, will bring uh, light, or shed light, not just for me, but I think to everyone. Uh, my doubt is about the difference uh, of possible relationships between influence and control and how they couple to micro and macro states. If we can, could uh, talk a, bit, a little bit more on that, it will be really important because the whole account to be reasonable to be depends on the differentiation of micro and macro states. It's a very ingenious move as well to say like, oh, we have a paltry uh, influence on the past because it's just at the micro level, not at the macro level. That's very ingenious as well. So depending on how you show us the relationship between influence and control with micro and macro states, it's even a more promising uh, form of defending the, the mentaculus. So um, I'm very glad that I had the possibility of comment on, on your work. And uh, that was very thought provoking. Thanks a lot. So I wanted to say a couple of things on your comments. First is, I think you're just amazing. You're like the utility player, uh, you know, on a, on, a, um, on a baseball team. They can be the pitcher or the, the shortstop or the... <laughs> um, so, and I think you brought up, um, if I understood you right, a couple of points that are really pretty interesting to develop. There's a, as was clear, there are a lot of loose ends or things that are going on here, and probably the feeling I had as I was giving the talk is that there's too many things going on, and um, probably should have just picked out a little part of this. Um, but one thing you mentioned is what would happen if super string theory turns out. So first of all, uh, from what I understand, I'm not going to hold my breath about that one. Okay, but but the 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 better the general structure of the mentaculus should just stay in shape. I'm pretty. I mean, there's a famous remark that was made by Eddington, I think, about um, the second law of thermodynamics, and he was referring to the probabilistic version because that's the one that that's become part of physics. He said something like, you know, maybe someone if somebody writes a paper that says that Einstein's theory of general relativity is wrong. Well, you think they're, they're probably crazy to think that, but maybe you should look at the paper. If somebody says, writes a paper that says Maxwell's electromagnetics is wrong, well, they're, you know, it's been so well established, they're probably wrong, but you should look at the paper. But if somebody writes a paper that says that the second law of thermodynamics is wrong, they, 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 could, they should just collapse into the deepest humiliation. That's almost the, okay. So, so and the general structure here, I'm confident will, um, if in fact the claims I'm making for it are right, that you really can, it, it's, it's not completely uncontroversial that the argument for the, all the thermodynamic laws can be gotten from the mentaculus. And there's you know, ongoing dispute about how to think about that. But, um, uh, it, but if I'm right that it can be, I think it'll persist any, whatever changes in the microdynamics, like with superstring theory occur. But then you said something else connected to that, which is really very interesting. And that's what happens in the universe the universe, on this account, the universe has this very low entropy state at an early time. Um, for if you hadn't thought about this before or heard about this before, what you should take away from it is that um, physicists now think that our universe at this very early time was in an incredibly special, special, special state. Uh, to say fine tune and doesn't even get close to just how special it is. Roger Penrose, you probably have heard about, a famous physicist mathematician, has a discussion of this in which he draws a little picture to illustrate it. And what he has is a sort of, he doesn't mean this exactly, the, the picture quite as serious as I'm going to describe it, but he has a, a picture of God 
he has, shows God as being an old man, uh, sort of picking the initial state of the universe. And it's like a giant haystack, and it's a teensy, teensy needle that God is going to pick to pick our, the state that our universe began in. It's much, much more fine-tuned than that even, okay? Okay. Um, and from that very, very special low entropy state, because low entropy states will evolve into high entropy states, and the basic reason for that is that there are so many more high entropy states than low entropy states. So if you were to picture this on a, let's say, on a, on, if I were to draw a picture on the board, which I didn't have, it would be, let's see, think about a big square that has all of the possible states as points in the square, the high entropy equilibrium state would occupy a gigantic big part of the square in the middle, and then the smaller entropy states, like where we are now in the universe, would be small states um, uh, uh, around the circumference of this big square. And what the universe did was to start in a very special state and wander in a somewhat erratic way to higher and higher entropy states, like the ice cube melting in, in, the, in the warm water. If the universe has a maximum entropy state, equilibrium state, one might wonder, well, what happens when it gets there? And Boltzmann thought about this, and what he said was, rightly, is that because the equilibrium states, the high entropy states, there are so many, many more of them, um, it basically will stay there for a long, long time. But it will every once in a while fluctuate out of this high entropy state. In fact, Boltzmann even drew a picture um, in which it, it, if you waited long enough, it would fluctuate out of the high entropy state into a state that's something like a state in which there's a, an auditorium in a, 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 like this one here with a bunch of people in it. Um, uh, that, there are, are states of mac microscopic motions of the particles, so the particles get into that state. And in fact, there's a, a theorem uh, that holds under general circumstances that Poincaré proved, which says that um, you wait long enough and the state of the universe will wander back into any macro state that it was at an earlier time. This is actually bad news for the mentaculus. Okay. If this was the case, what it would mean is that on the basis of what we see now in, in, our, in our auditorium, if I were to make a prediction about what would go on when you open the door, well, what you would see when you open the door, the most likely thing would be just equilibrium. You'd just be sucked into, you know, and basically empty space out there. Okay, but we, we know that's not the case. This is a point, incidentally, that Feynman makes in the essay that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this would be bad news for the, for the mentaculus. We'd have to give some sort of argument for why we shouldn't, why we should think that we're in the initial phase of the universe from the entropy uh, boundary before we got to equilibrium. Um, I'm not gonna give a long discussion about why there's good reason to think about that, but I think there are things to say. But one of the really interesting issues in cosmology is to give some account of why it is that the universe has this very low entropy boundary. And that's, uh, uh, cos philosophers of cosmology and cosmologists will often say that this is the, the, the biggest problem in cosmology right now. So you brought that up yeah. too. So I thought that was interesting. And the last thing you brought up that I, was interesting to me was that it's important to have a clearer distinction between what's macro and what's micro. I agree that that's very, very important. The way thermodynamics and statistical mechanics started was it with a conception of macro in terms of certain macroscopic properties like temperature, which have to do with the average kinetic energy in a region, density, which is the average mass in a region, uh, uh, the uh, average electromagnetic radiation in a region, and so on. For small regions, um, this would be what the macroscopic state is. And in fact, if we had small, small enough regions and we had a description of the macroscopic um, state of the, let's say, the auditorium by saying, here's a little region, let's say its size was, I don't know, a micron uh, volume, of, 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 uh, 
uh, uh, one cubic micron or something like that, um, then um, probably um, there being people and chairs and so on in the room would supervene on this macroscopic description. But of course, there'd be infinitely many microscopic states that could realize this that are different from each other and would evolve differently over time. Some of them would evolve for, and so most of them would evolve so that entropy would increase. Very few of them would evolve, because few here is relative to a measure, since there are infinitely many in both cases, would evolve so that entropy would decrease over time. So it is important to have a clear macro and micro distinction, but I, physicists work with an account based in terms of the ordinary thermodynamic properties, and that works for anything that, phys that, that I know is interested in, that physicists are interested in thermodynamics at any rate. Anyhow, thanks for your comments. Hi, um, do, you, um, do you think that if we didn't have influence over the past, then we wouldn't have free will, and that if it wasn't for something like the Mentaculus, then we wouldn't have free will? So let's say, so the counterfactual that you're, that you're imagining would involve by having to change the physics. So I'm not sure what to say, because in fact, given the way I think the physics is, we do have influence. Over it. So, but, um, so I'm asking about worlds with different physics. Yeah, so for, so for example, if the... If the fundamental laws were truly indeterministic, then it could turn out to be the case that we don't have influence over the past, but we still might have, there still might be free will then, sure. So Wagen's argument also goes wrong somewhere else? So, well, his, his the, yes, there would go wrong because he's assuming determinism. So, so what I was thinking is that if the laws were at the micro level indeterministic, then they'd be branching at indeterministic places. So there, in evaluating the counterfactuals, if in fact the antecedent was one in which the, um, you could go on that branch or on that branch, but, but right before that was, was the branch point, then you wouldn't have any influence over the, the, the alternative counterfactual antecedents we're thinking about would keep the past exactly the same. So you wouldn't have uh, influence over the past, but Van Inwagen's argument would go wrong because he was assuming determinism. Could there be deterministic physics where we don't have influence over the past? If our brains were different. So for example, yeah, oh, I see. So if our brains were macroscopic, then, um, I, uh, uh, let me not answer that off the top of my head, okay? I I'm wonder, I'm wonder though, I was assuming that our brains were, have, were that decisions involve very small changes. I guess it, it the right thing to say then if our brains were macroscopic, it might be then that we'd have enormous influence over the past. Right? Not that we wouldn't, but that we might have influence so that we'd make for a big difference over the, the past, we'd have a very different sense then about what time, about how time works. Thank you, Barry. I had uh, two clarificatory questions actually. One, one of them concerning well, the dynamic laws that are mentioned or included in the mentaculus, uh, it seemed to me by the form that you presented them that they should be considered as, a, as primitive. So they, they do not, uh, they're not determined, so to say, or they do not follow from the boundary conditions that existed in, in the moment of the Big Bang. And But, well, the thing is, uh, is it is it all right to 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 simply assume them as primitive? Shouldn't assume should, what? Yeah, them as primitive. Shouldn't there be? Well, well, w wouldn't that make them necessary or something like that for all possible worlds? I, I, I'm not really sure how to 
to understand uh, these laws as, 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 as primitive? The dynamical laws? Yeah. Um, I th well, I just, so if, if, for example, if one was involved in Dave's project of constructing the world, uh, Dave, I think, would probably say, well, look, we need a, some sort of fundamental ontology and we need some laws. And the laws were, are extra items not, over and above the, the fundamental ontology. Maybe it's particles or fields, and maybe there's a, some you know, consciousness sprinkled in in the appropriate places also, um, but also laws. And so one way to think about laws is that they are extra items, literally, in some sense, things. Not things in the, like the thingy sense of being bits of, of, uh, of material, but, uh, but, but if God were to, I mean, here's a way to put it. If God were to create the world, you know, I mean, Dave constructed the world, but usually we think of God constructing the world. Um, if, uh, the, the construct the world, God would have to make the initial conditions and make the laws. There's an extra thing he has to do. But it doesn't make the laws necessary in the metaphysical sense, if there is such a sense, which a lot of the discussions here have assumed that there is such a sense, um, because God could have made different laws. So if we imagine a world that was Newtonian, okay, the fundamental dynamical laws would be basically F equals MA. That's the single dynamical law in Newtonian physics. If it's quantum mechanics, it's some version of Schrodinger's <laughs> equation, and maybe something else if there's a collapse of the wave function. So there could be different laws. So that's one way to think about laws. Lewis thought about laws in a different way. Lewis thought that the laws were not something that God had to create in addition to everything else. Lewis thought that, that what the laws did is they supervened on the whole block universe of the, the distribution of matter or fields, whatever it is, throughout the whole the history of the universe. That's a, a somewhat deflationary conception of laws. It's gotten to be called a Humean conception of, of, uh, of laws. Uh, that, I prefer that kind of an account for various reasons, which would you know, could go into an, over dinner maybe if we wanted to. But, um, uh, uh, but these are two ways of thinking about laws, but neither one of them will make the laws metaphysically necessary. Um, yeah, they could be, but then they are arbitrary, so to say. They, they well, I don't know that they're they arbitrary. You know, what does arbitrary mean? We can say, you know, that um, the, you know, <clears throat> the choice of, well, I'm sure the choice of Tiradentes is the past place to have the conference wasn't arbitrary, but let's say um, uh, somebody decided that they were going to go on a, a trip someplace in Brazil, and the way they did it was to um, spin a spinner, and wherever it landed on a something, they'd say that's arbitrary. But that already is something in a, in a world in which there are already laws. The idea of there being the notion of something like coincidence or arbitrary or something like that applying from outside of the world with, in which there are laws seems to me to not make any good sense. Okay, it's, I, think it wasn't, I think it wasn't turned on initially. Um, I wasn't clear how the statistical mechanical explanation of time's arrow is going to work on the assumption that the fundamental dynamics are deterministic. So you've got one way for the ice cube to stay frozen, 10 to the 23 ways for it to melt. Um, but given that the fundamental dynamics are deterministic, all bar one of those is nomically impossible. So they're kind of mere epistemic possibilities, aren't they? Um, so I'm kind of wondering whether you, you, epistemology in, epistemology out. So I should expect the ice cube to melt if I don't know the initial microstate. But how's that going to explain why time itself has a direction? So let's see. Um, I didn't really see why, what the tension was. It's right that, um, uh, that if you knew the initial microstate, there would be only one epistemic, only one way in which the, the, uh, the ice cube will evolve. You, you don't know the initial microstate, do you? No. No, um, Does anybody, have, will anybody ever know the, the microstate? Forget about the microstate of the universe. Just think of the microstate of an ice cube. Will anybody I mean, ever? Obviously, I'm, I'm happy to allow that I should expect the ice cube to melt given my state of knowledge. But if you want to explain why time itself has an arrow, don't you need to rely on uh, a richer 
sense in which these alternatives, because it's not like... So it's, I mean, not a, so it's not an epistemic, so okay, so the probabilities in this account are not epistemic probabilities. So these are genuine possibilities, the other direction. They're the genuine ones. probabilities. But you don't regard the, the alternative microstates as possible, right? Because they're well, they're possible. You know, the word possible is always possible given such and such. M metaphysically possible is given, possible given the laws of metaphysics, whatever they might be. Nomologically possible is possible given the physical laws. Well, of course, all those 10 to the 23 possibilities plus one are, um, are nomically possible, okay? Um, what's possible given the microstate and the laws? Well, only one possibility yeah. is possible then. Well, I guess that's the, that's the tension that I'm But I don't see a tension. If it's, if it's already determined exactly which route the ice cube is going to take, uh, that it'll take some route from cube to melted, then surely that's the thing that's, that, that should be explaining time's arrow, not all these other possibilities. That but it doesn't. Other. It doesn't explain time's arrow. Uh, because, in fact, given the state in the future and the de deterministic laws, the past is determined equally well. Does that cause you to... No, I, mean, I, I, I guess I'm not getting the tension across quite... It, it's not entirely clear in my head what the tension is. I, mean, the, when I, I used to really like this StatMech picture of Time's Arrow. Um, and the way I, th I was thinking of it uh, back then was like, well... It's as if all of these, imagine all the different possibilities getting tried out at random. It's almost bound to pick a route from ice cube to thawed, but that's not how it is, right? The, the prior dynamics are going to determine exactly which route it takes. That's right. So the last thing you said is right, but you're thinking about time and time passing in a way that metaphysicians have sometimes encouraged. Metaphysicians like, I don't know, Michael Tooley, but completely wrongly, okay? The idea being that as time passes, possibilities get pruned off. I mean, that's, that's the intuitive sense. I, that's the, when I think of it that way, I can see how the explanation might work. It's when I stop thinking of it that way that I don't really see how that, I'm explaining time. This is, that's just a really has nothing to do with time okay. passing. Our world is a world in which when ice cubes are put in water, they melt. This is deterministic, okay? that when gases, when perfume is sprayed into a corner of the room, they spread. That when people are born, um, they're born looking nice and pink, and after a while they get to look like you, and a little bit later they get to look like me, although you, you'll have to grow some hair. <laughs> um, I'm planning to, I haven't quite worked it out yet, but it's going to be Okay, we live in a world like that. That's our world. The deterministic laws will be such that given the complete initial condition of our world, that will entail that this is what happens in our world, okay? But in addition to the micro laws, there's this macro law. The macro law is the low entropy condition of the, early, of the universe at one of its boundaries and the probability distribution. Now you might wonder how these can be laws compatible with the deterministic laws, and that would be an interesting question, and that's where the Humeanism would come into the discussion. Maybe this is more for dinner than for okay. right now. But the idea being that the reason that there's a time arrow is because in our world there is this real asymmetry. The real asymmetry does come from the things that happen in our world, and they do come from uh, any, uh, the initial condition and the deterministic laws. But you're, you may be imagining that the time direction is coming from the deterministic law evolving the initial condition. I think that's how I was thinking of it, yeah. What? That, that's kind of how I was thinking about it, yeah. Right. So, 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 for example, my m main opponent in this stuff is Tim Maudlin. I, I can't mention his name here without telling a quick story. No, I shouldn't. I won't tell. I'll tell the story at dinner. Okay, but so Tim thinks that there is a fundamental direct, fundamental directionality in time, and that that fundamental directionality is very much connected to the how, to laws and how laws work. That laws take the state of the world and produce subsequent states of the world. I'm re I completely reject that picture, and 
um, there would be a, a long argument between someone who has a, the meta, kind of metaphysical view that you're expressing and the metaphysical view I have. And if his side were to win, then he would have a directionality of time that has nothing to do with the mentaculous. But it would be hard to see what that directionality of time has to do with what's really important to us about the directionality of time, like that we can influence things in one temporal direction but not in the other, because that comes from the way counterfactuals work in the world. And I think we have a pretty good account that, that comes from the mentaculous of that, uh, of, of how that works. Okay, so I don't know if what I said really makes much sense, but I think the discussion for us would be one in which we, I would have to disabuse you of your metaphysical picture. Thanks for your show. Uh, I have a lot of questions. I can, I couldn't say all that. Uh, I'm choose. Uh, uh, How many pages are there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when, when, uh, uh, bom. When you say the, when you say about the uh, about the process, uh, when you say time has no direction, correct? Time itself has no direction. Uh, uh, it, it's wrong because uh, we don't think about time. We think about the process of time. Uh, it's like energy, energy, energy. Don't exist energy. It's a kind of a thing uh, like uh, people uh, mystic, mysticists. Uh, Mysticism used to use, uh, but it, it don't exist in physics. So we have to think about the process of time. It's like a delta, I don't know how to say, the, the delta T. Uh, you, you just think about time in, in, the, in the process. Uh, it's, it's one thing. I, yeah. So, so, yeah, there, there are, so, for example, you might be sitting at one time, standing at another time. So there's a difference in what, the shape of your, where your molecules are between the two different times, and there's a trajectory joining them. So I think that all of that holds. And in fact, people um, change in their body shape to regular ways. So I do think that there are, of course, processes in time that change over time, being, meaning that they are different distribution of matter or fields at different points in time. So, so uh, uh, maybe I, uh, I understand wrong. Uh, uh, you, 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 you said that uh, we can influence best. It's OK? Uh, uh, thinking about the micro states, okay? Uh, uh, a micro state or micro states? Micro. So. micro. See. Sí. Micro and micro. See, see. Okay. Uh, he's talking about the micro or macro? Uh, uh, we can influence the best with the the smaller. <laughs> the, the, I'm, I'm, uh, so it's an microphone. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, need, I really need a macrophone. <laughs> um, okay, so it was very important to my talk that I was explaining influence in terms of these conditionals, subjunctive conditionals or counterfactuals. So to have influence over the future means that there are things that I can do such that if I were to do them, 
the future would be in various ways. So I have influence over where, what I eat for dinner. I might eat fish because I can order fish or I can order meat, okay? And um, that would have an influence over what I actually get to eat for dinner, okay? So if I were to order, if I were to decide that I want meat, I would eat meat. If I would decide that I want fish, I would eat fish. So these are the conditionals. Um, if the laws are deterministic, the micro laws are deterministic, and in fact, I order meat, not fish, it'll still be true that if I were to have decided to have ordered fish, I would eat fish. That would still be true, but in fact, I ordered meat. Um, it would also be true that if I had decided to order fish, the past would be different all the way back to the Big Bang, but it would be different just microscopically in ways that are uh, not knowable by me. But you, you are uh, in the present, and you, in, 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 if you influence the past, you have to think about the one who is in the present. Not, uh, not, not something that, that happens uh, before, later. Uh, before, no? huh? so I'm not following too well. So, uh, you don't understand. Less one, so so then we talk about this. Uh, we, uh, I really inter interesting about this. Uh, 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 there's a, a book uh, that Schrunger uh, uh, writes uh, called call "What Is Life." And and he's uh, it uh, and he say, he talks about uh, negative entropy. Whose whose book is this? Schrodinger. Uh, Schrodinger. Schrodinger. Right. Right. You know about him. I, I want if you know uh, to which say book about by Schrodinger? Him. What is life? What is life? It's, yeah, it's I know the book. Right. And and what do you think about this? Uh, about your work. Um, so Schrodinger. I don't know exactly what Schrodinger had to say about statistical mechanics, though I know he's written about it. He was certainly one of the great, great physicists of the 20th century, and he, he and Einstein had the, um, the, the right views about quantum mechanics uh, when Schrodinger was writing earlier. I, I guess in What is Life, Schrodinger, um, does make the point that there seems to be a kind of tension between there being the development of life and the increase in entropy. And he was interested in showing why, that, why uh, systems can become more complicated as they do in our world um, by the development of life, while at the same time entropy increasing. I don't remember very well exactly what Schrodinger says about that there, but the basic story is this, that um, increasing complexity, like with the development of life, and increasing entropy are not in conflict with each other. Um, you can see this if, for example, you take some ink and pour it into water. Uh, at first, the ink is at the top of the water, and everything is very simple, and the entropy is quite low. As the ink sinks into the water, it forms tendrils and, and funny shapes. Things get more and more complicated, all the time entropy increasing. After a long time, or not that long, but after a while, the, the ink and the water get totally mixed up with each other. That is a state of equilibrium. Entropy for this system is maximum, and it returns to simplicity. And this is the way f f people, physicists, would think of the universe now. It started in very low entropy, and also very simple. But it's over 
time, it's gotten more and more complicated as stars formed and galaxies formed um, and ultimately life formed on some of the planets around some of the stars. But ultimately entropy will continue to increase throughout the history of the universe and it'll, after a while, be, the universe will become simpler as things fall into black holes. Black holes are repositories of enormous amounts of entropy. I don't know if that helps you very much. Schrodinger didn't know about black holes, but so he did, couldn't have said what I said. But, but he was interested. So for, and on Earth, the low entropy, the sun sends to the Earth um, a, a lot of low entropy electromagnetic radiation, photons and other radiation. And th this um, a low entropy is it, it, uh, radiation is made use of in things like chlorophyll in plants and the forming of other things like coal and so on out of the decay of plants, which ultimately increases in entropy. And then the Earth radiates into space radiation at a much, much higher entropy radiation. I don't know if that's much help for your question or not, but we can talk about it later maybe a little bit. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to ask you just something. Uh, there must be something uh, wrong, on the, but here is a possibility. Uh, suppose I, I am such that the stuff of, uh, of I'm made of uh, is just very, it turns to always get this very improbable uh, root. Uh, so the whole universe is actually increasing entropy, but you know my stuff always take the tiny probability. So now if the relation, uh, if there is a, such a thing as influencing uh, the past, but and control is just doing it in such a way that it, it becomes robust enough, so it, there is a pattern. Uh, so if I'm the super improbable person, I could actually get my money in IBM and, and all the... So, Marco, you could have to ask, you could have to come closer and ask your Sorry. Uh, the, the thing is, if, uh, if uh, Eric, uh, did you hear anything? <laughs> or where did it stop? Okay, I'm, I'm going to do it again. It's a short question. Suppose uh, everything I'm made of is just uh, uh, so that uh, instead of things happening uh, according to all the, the laws, and uh, I just take the very tiny probability and I decrease entropy everything that happens in my body. So the whole universe is increasing uh, entropy, but here, things just go the other way. So I'm the super improbable guy. So you're like Benjamin Button. Yeah. <laughs> so if I, if I am uh, Button, uh, the thing is, uh, if uh, we can, or there is such a thing as influence in past, and controlling past is just having this in such a way that there is a pattern or it's robust enough, uh, I, could I be the guy that could go back time, invest my money in Apple, and... First of all, oops, sorry. Um, so he, what Marco's imagining is that in some small part of the universe, just where he is, he starts, look, sort of like his, his beard falls away, but instead of, it falls away in such a way that he, he has his baby face is revealed. And after a while, we look at him, and, and he's wearing diapers, <laughs> and, and so on, right? That's what you're imagining. Okay, first of all, that as long as you're interacting with the rest of the universe, and that even amounts for radiation interacting with you that I can see you with, this won't happen, because as long as there's radiation interacting with you, you will, your states will be, will, ev will very, very likely not evolve like that. They will return to entropy increasing. Nevertheless, what you're saying is possible. It's, it's okay. Um, okay, so you're asking, if that were to happen, would you be able to influence? Okay. Um, not on the account of influence I'm giving, because the, the account of influ influence had to do with the counterfactual, like, if you were, I mean, I'm not even sure how to think about your decisions under the circumstances that you're imagining, but if, if you were to, let's say, do something which amounts to making a, a decision, okay, to um, change how things were 
when you were a baby, okay? Because you're, you're now sort of evolving. So I look at you in, relative to my time, to how things, time is going where I am. It's going in the, in, in the usual direction. For you, you're just growing younger. Um, so you're asking, could you do something such that you would influence, let's say, I don't know, something about your early, your life? I think the best thing for me to say is that's a really interesting question, and I should think about it without saying something off the top of my head. The, the first thing I would say is, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> um, but, but I have thought about some things like that, because there are real puzzles about how to think about time travel together with this account of entropy, which is sort of the way I'm understanding your take. So, so there are time travel stories that look like they can be made consistent, at least they don't run into this grandfather paradox. Lewis himself wrote a paper, a famous paper about this. Um, and there are um, uh, solutions to, to Einstein's field equations, which also involve what looks like something like um, the t time, um, the, the arrow of time within general relativity changing its direction. What had the happens with respect to the entropic arrows of time is very puzzling to me. I've once spent like a whole day trying to think about this, and the best I had at the end of the day was a splitting headache. Um, <laughs> um, and I don't, don't even know if anybody has written anything about, the, about this uh, question. But that would be an interesting, it, it would, it's interesting for me to try to figure out what to say about it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. <laughs>